Welcome everyone, an official welcome to the ACAP experience session. I, my name is Matt Thurgood. I'm the course leader for criminology and justice here at ACAP. Uh, and we'll be talking a bit about the media and a bit about murder. Uh, just a note that we are recording the session. Uh, so you won't appear uh, on screen or anything if you just keep your, your video off, et cetera. Uh, we have the chat box going, so if you have any questions at any stage, whether from me or for uh, Amelia, who will meet, one of our students, uh, David, our course advisor, who'll be talking to you shortly, uh, or any of the team in the background, there's a fair few of us uh, ready to answer your questions, so please do uh, pop your question into the chat. Uh, for the moment, though, I will pass you on to David, who'll just give you a few details uh, about ACAP and why we're a great place to study. Awesome. Thank you very much there, Matt. Um, so hi, everybody. Welcome to the ACAP Criminology Experience Session, uh, which today is focused on the why is the media preoccupied with murder? Uh, so my name's David. I'm one of ACAP's National Course Advisors. Um, and in tonight's session, myself and ACAP Senior Lecturer and Discipline Lead for Criminology and Justice, which is Matt Thurgood, which has just been speaking to us, um, we'll take you through a criminally good experience. Um, so I'd like to uh, also let you know that uh, these sessions are all recorded. So uh, can I please ask you to all accept the recording when prompted? Uh, also, just in case uh, any uh, of you are interested, we do have an information session tomorrow night um, on counselling starting at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, followed by psychology as well at 6 p.m. So that could also be of great interest to you potentially as well. And we'd love to see you there too. Um, okay, so let's just take a moment in commencing uh, tonight's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognising their continuing connection to the land, uh, waters and culture. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and we recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. In this session, we'll cover a brief overview of ACAP uh, we'll hear from one of our current criminology students, and then we'll just jump into the session with Matt as we explore media preoccupied with murder. Um, looking at the relationship between the two, along with some maths around crime and the effects um, media has through their relation, uh, representations, I should say. So at the end, uh, what we'll do as well is we'll open up our questions and answer session. Uh, however, at any stage, if you feel like you have any questions throughout, please feel free to post um, those in the chat function where one of my colleagues, either uh, Miles, Shelley or Alex will respond. Um, so who are we? So ACAP is the Australian College of Applied Professions. Uh, we have just changed from the Australian College of Applied Psychology, just in case you've got a bit confused with that. We are now the Australian College of Applied Professions, proudly. And uh, we have been delivering specialist courses in uh, the helping professions field for over 38 uh, years now, since about 1983. Um, we are a national provider of these programs, delivering on-campus studies in Sydney, uh, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. Um, and very recently, Byron Bay. Now, we also cater to those living rurally and internationally um, through our online or blended delivery model. And uh, this online or on-campus delivery can be selected for criminology programs, meaning it's a fantastic way to build on uh, your career um, or start something new while being uh, flexible as well within your current uh, uh, lifestyle. Um, ACAP doesn't just promote criminology uh, programs. Um, you may also be familiar with other disciplines, as I've just mentioned as well, um, such as social work, counselling, coaching and psychology. Um, each of these disciplines have their own delivery methods um, that you can choose from. And we're very happy to uh, discuss uh, what uh, may best suit uh, you personally. Now, um, since ACAP was founded, we've successfully graduated over 20,000 students uh, nationwide, which is incredible, um, having them industry ready upon completion of their qualifications. Very exciting. At ACAP, we encourage and promote diversity. Uh, we support students from all walks of life and promote equity um, or inequality, um, sustainability and advocacy for every community. Uh, we hold regular catch-ups for those who are interested to, uh, to get involved as well, and we meet like-minded individuals and develop lasting connections. Um, we've seen um, that extracurricular uh, initiatives and programs like this uh, don't just boost student morale, 
but uh, help them to flourish in their studies with peer-to-peer -peer support. Now, so why do students choose ACAP? Why us? Well, it's a combination between the support services available and the quality of education. With a combination of lectures and tutorials, uh, educators who work in the industry, which is so important, and our student placements. Our students are delivered with learning experiences to support their future careers. At um, our degrees, I should say, are accredited uh, with bodies such as uh, the ACA, uh, the CICA, all these acronyms, all these lovely acronyms, ICF, and also PACPA. And uh, if you don't understand those acronyms, please uh, ask in our chat, we'll be happy to help you out. And uh, the three intakes a year we make um, are more flexible for our students to pick up um, learning um, when it suits them. And uh, the fees are supported by fee-help um, student loans or upfront payments as well. Um, so now also ACAP doesn't just support you in your class time either. We have amazing support structures um, set in place here. We've got various networks and support services available um, to ensure that you get the most out of your studies and excel with your personal and professional growth as well. Um, we have services such as student learning support teams um, who uh, run regular webinars and workshops um, and have um, how-to guides as well, uh, video tutorials and even their own websites. Uh, and uh, also on top of that, what we do is we found that um, we have useful information that can be found giving you more independence throughout your journey through various other processes as well. And you can always give us a call anytime we'll be here to help you out. Um, now, we even actually sit down with you as well. We have one-on-one -on -one sessions um, to go through study plans if necessary. And we're very happy to help you out at any stage. Um, and uh, we have a various um, other uh, important uh, structures in place as well to assist you with assessments, um, such as academic writing, um, referencing, presenting, um, how to plan your study week, et cetera. There's quite a number of other support structures in place as well. Um, we have a free and confidential counselling services uh, available for students also. So uh, that's for any students that have actually currently enrolled with us. Um, which is a fantastic support as well. And uh, I think we've all used a, that at one stage. Um, so now that you know a little bit about our ACAP, I should say in general, um, I now hand you over to Amelia, um, who um, is our current uh, student in our Bachelor of Criminology and Justice course. Um, and also once again, Matt Thurgood, who's our fantastic discipline head for criminology. Go ahead. Beautiful. So as David said, my name is Amelia. Um, I'm just about to finish my first year of my bachelor's in criminology and justice here. Um, just quickly, I'm joining from NAM today um, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, like past, like most people, after high school, I was so confused about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to study. And I was looking for months and months and months and I finally came across ACAP. And I was drawn in because I saw the flexibility, like what David was saying before, um, the smaller class sizes. And I was just hearing about all these positive experiences and stories from past students. And I, was, I knew I was making the right decision by applying. Um, after my first year of really fantastic experiences, I was fortunate enough to get selected for the Student Rep Council and the Courses Council here for the Criminology Discipline. And I'm very excited to start working closer with the ACAP team and for the ACAP students. Um, whenever there was an issue or I was struggling with mental health, like as we all do, um, or handing in assignments or dealing with anything else that life threw at me, um, the ACAP staff has been nothing short of amazing. Um, one example, I was swapping degrees earlier this year um, from psych science over to criminology and the course advisors, the senior lecturers and the admin team, every last person made the process so helpful, so easy and made a really stressful decision, very stress-free and it was amazing. Um, I've developed a fantastic relationships with all of my lecturers, all of my tutors, um, a lot of the staff that I've met, I've just had nothing but great experiences with, experiences with and um, I can confidently say that studying at ACAP has been the best decision for my education as seen right there. Um, but yeah, I'll be staying back um, till the end. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask. 
Um, I can send my email in the chat as well if you want to ask me in private. Um, but I wish you all the best with your decision making and I look forward to meeting you. Thanks so much, Amelia. And thanks to David as well. I hope you got uh, some, some background to ACAP and what we do and obviously why we think it's a, a great place to study whether we work here, whether we study here. Uh, so on to, <clears throat> excuse me, just going through puberty, um, on to our uh, key topic of discussion for the night. Uh, I want to just have us think about crime. I want to think about the way that media represents and portrays crime and why it seems there is a fascination uh, with murder yeah, and violent crime. So we won't go through all of these questions that I have on the screen there, um, but perhaps, perhaps just the first one for the moment, and then I'll throw some other questions at you while we're going, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, if you can in the chat, uh, what do you believe is the most serious crime affecting Australia right now? Whether you're thinking of the country overall, where you live, however you want to think about it. Uh, Kirsty, thanks. Kicking things off there, domestic violence. Yeah, Bronwyn, thank you, family violence. Any other suggestions? I should say, there are no right or wrong answers to this one. Sajida, child abuse, thank you. Josh, disinformation, interesting. Ebony, cybercrime. I think we, we keep hearing a lot about disinformation. I don't know whether there is a law or what laws there are around it. I think there's regulations. I don't know about criminal law, interesting one. Any other suggestions? Youth crime, yeah, thanks, Ebony. And yeah, everyone's welcome to provide multiple suggestions. Thanks, Alyssa, drug-related violence and crime. Repetti, capitalist greed. Again, unfortunately, not criminal, uh, but there's certainly a number of offences that draw from capitalist greed. Uh, everything from fraud, through to uh, exploitation of the environment, exploitation of workers, etc. You've gotten me all serious there, Repetti. So Ebony, yeah, agreed, white collar crime. Um, thanks, uh, I'll, I'll stop those suggestions coming. Oh, actually, you're welcome to keep providing suggestions, but in the interest of time, um, I think it's really interesting that we've got quite a broad array of offences there, uh, ones that aren't necessarily, you know, considered maybe directly harmful to people. So something like white collar crime, you know, people argue, well, people lose money, but you can always get money back uh, versus say, you know, things like family violence that can obviously result in um, death. Uh, and we'll touch on that a little bit this evening. Um, and then broader things, so, you know, something like drug drug use leading to crime or, you know, um, as a result of trauma and crime and all of that, all of those things are quite uh, complex. So each one of the suggestions that you've provided is, is pretty complex. So Josh, even your one around disinformation, I mean, like I say, I don't, there's not a criminal offence around it specifically, but it feeds into a whole lot of sort of broader social issues as we've been seeing over the past, what, two years. Um, with COVID and politics and all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, uh, really, really interesting suggestions. Um, so thanks for, for throwing those, those out there. Um, we might just jump to the last question because I'm curious, given those very insightful suggestions, why, so why you think... Uh, that particular offence or act is the most serious one at the moment, right? So 
whether you suggested one or not, pick one and, and perhaps think about why that one, why family violence or why child abuse, why drug, um, drug related crime, etc. And what sort of frames your understanding of it? Does that make sense? I don't know if I asked too many questions there all at once. If I did, I apologize, but all right, thanks, Kirsty. So personal experience, yeah. So a teacher living in a, a rural remote community. Yeah, Connor, thanks. Yeah, that was the language I was going to use, lived experience. Um, it's quite a an important aspect. That's something that I think we're finally beginning to understand the importance of. Uh, and you'll hear, if you attend any of the other uh, ACAP sessions, experience sessions, you hear colleagues my colleagues in, in counselling, in social work, even in psychology, talking about the importance of lived experience. It's something that criminology is only just starting really to consider um, because, as you might be aware, we, we haven't really dealt with, you know, victims uh, well as a criminal justice system or as a field of study. So, um, you know, the, the importance of lived experience and bringing that through is, is quite an important one. So I like that we've hit that really quickly. Um, other thoughts, so Alyssa, so the why, the ripple effect on children and community. So yeah, certainly child abuse, certainly family violence. Yeah, it's that into, what do we call the intergenerational trauma aspect? And there's a lot of different aspects to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kirsty, Amelia, Ebony, it looks like we're all on the same uh, path there. So the media and indeed, uh, Kirsty, thanks. The focus they, they place on things like kidnapping especially child or children so child abduction that kind of thing um and yeah ebony is stealing my thunder a bit so <laughs> the way that the media represents crimes um yeah certainly the way that the media portrays i won't go further with your comment just because that's what we're about to get into um it looks like we've got agreement around the media Bronwyn yet. So the massive fall effect for the community that comes from family violence. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. It's not just about, it's important to acknowledge, it's not just about you know, the immediate victim or victims, but there are the flow on effects to family, to neighbours, to the broader community, uh, for sure. Um, I'm just working my way through. All your comments are coming through. <laughs> no need to apologise, everybody. Uh, Sajida, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, by the way. Apologies if not. Child abuse can be easily swept under the carpet because the relevant associations may not recognise it. Yeah, so, I mean, child abuse, child sexual abuse or violence, I mean, it's it's such a difficult one. It's a really tricky one. Um, I could, I won't go into too much of a, a, a tangent here, but there is the issue of, of mandatory reporting. So we know that medical practitioners and in Victoria anyway, there's laws around... Um, uh, health professionals and teachers, mandatory reporting if they suspect that a child is being abused. At the same time, that places, you know, maybe it's okay for medical professionals, yeah, who can, uh, who have some maybe knowledge and better insight into those things, you know, can recognize an injury or, or what trauma looks like, how it manifests. Um, difficult for a teacher, though, um, who's maybe dealing with, you know, a lot of different issues so yeah it's it's a it's a, again like i say a complex or complicated um uh, issue um yeah uh bronwyn victims of family violence poor nurturing yeah not good connections oh there's yeah there's a lot there so i think it's an interesting um point you make so often we we consider well there's a bit of a trope a bit of a stereotype uh, and we'll get into this perhaps a little bit too tonight, that, you know, for example, serial killers must have been abused as children kind of thing, when there's actually little, uh, that's one of the myths, right, of crime. Um, there's actually little evidence for that. But a victim, if someone's victimised early in life, they're actually more likely to become a victim again later in life, right? And they're also vulnerable to things like drug use and abuse, um, lower chance of, of, you know, completing educational qualifications, employment, those sorts of things. So there are significant flow on effects. Yeah. Um, and Sam, yeah, I agree with Ebony. Uh, there is certainly um, a social context and a cultural context to crime. It's something that we talk about, or I actually, I find really, really interesting the way that different cultures consider different acts 
as criminal or not, as acceptable or not, um, even over time. So what you know we consider currently in Australian society to be problematic wasn't the case 10 years ago, let alone 30 years ago, right? I mean, someone, um, sorry, I can't remember the, um, uh, someone mentioned cybercrime earlier on. Uh, you know, if it was 1985 and someone was talking about cybercrime, people would have been going, what are you talking about? Uh, it's something in, I don't think there even were science fiction movies getting into that, right? Maybe Terminator, the first Terminator. Anyway, um, so yeah, the, it's context is everything. Um, that's uh, I'm running a unit at the moment called Deviance, where that's just my my almost bumper sticker. Yeah, it's my my line every week is context is everything. We need to think about um, what's happening in a society at any given time. Um, the comment around disinformation that is very much a 2019, 2020, 2021 thing, and it's probably going to become a an issue, you know, for the next decade or so. So. Um, all right. Sorry, I better stop myself just because, <laughs> again, interest of time, this is stuff we can just keep on talking about. So thank you for your comments. Um, keep your comments and questions coming, all right, while I'm talking. Uh, if you've got an idea, if you want to challenge something I'm saying, feel free. Um, yeah, and certainly if you have questions, please do keep them coming. So we want to focus on, as a few of you have hit on the head, the relationship between media and crime. And it's clearly a really close-knit one. And what I want to note is we're not just going to think about news media. It's obviously a, a key issue uh, and something that we see a, a pretty clear relationship between. We will talk about news media, but also want us to think about other forms of media too. So fictional media, social media, all of these play roles in how society understands crime, its perception of crime, um, and everything that follows from that. So starting really broadly, and I'll focus on news, first of all, um, there's clearly, I think, a societal interest in crime and also criminal justice issues, right? It's newsworthy, to put it simply. It's something that draws eyeballs, yeah, whether that's to, I mean, in the old day, newspapers to the TV news. I don't know how many people watch TV news anymore, uh, apart from, you know, my parents. Um, but now it's what, to clicks, to uh, podcasts. Yeah, Bronwyn, you can throw that one in too. Um, there's a whole bunch of crime, true crime, et cetera, podcasts. It's all part of the, the package, right? So clearly, uh, as a Western society in particular, we are interested in, in what crime is and what it involves in how the system responds to it, the criminal justice system responds to it, um, often how it fails to deal with crime appropriately. Right, whether that's you know trying to catch a killer, I mean, there's how many series called that versus how they um, deal with the case. So, you know, perhaps someone being found guilty of a crime they didn't commit, all of that stuff. There's clear, clear human interest in that, and there's clear newsworthiness. So, Dukes, for example, Yvonne Dukes has written a ton of stuff on the crime and media, and there's actually 12 elements she talks about. So, I've just put a few of them there. Um, about what crime presents, right? It's dramatic, it involves a level of risk, right? Because often the crimes that we hear about are risky, uh, whether to the offender, to victims, to society broadly. There's an individualistic aspect too, to the way that crime is reported. And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more later too, but often it's framed, right? As an individual offender versus an individual victim or maybe a group of individual victims, yeah? Um, Whereas something, uh, Rapetti's comment earlier around, you know, capitalist greed, right? There's no individualism in that. There are broad structures, right? We can talk about family violence as occurring because of broad structures within society. Yes, individuals offend, right? And commit those crimes, but we've got gendered structures, okay? That place men in a position of power over women. Right? Talking broadly about, you know, patriarchy from a feminist viewpoint individualism doesn't help us understand that but that's often the way that crime is construed bad offender innocent victim right? and then it goes from there there is a level of simplification that comes with it uh, and of course the violent imagery um, so these are all things that we'll touch on as we go uh, as a number of you pointed out as well there there is a concern that the mass media is 
really the key and I'd suggest probably the only source of information for society. So even though we can certainly draw on lived experience, you know, I only know what I've experienced though and maybe what other people have, have told me. Um, whereas the media is presented as a, as a kind of broader um, source, a source that covers everyone and it's a bit more authoritative in that sense, even though it might not be. Yeah, but we've been, I don't know whether it's something, it's the way how we're educated to understand information, but it's almost that idea that we're unlikely or less likely to believe, you know, what one person says if they're standing on the street, but if they're on a television, yeah, talking to us, we'll believe them, right? So there's, you know, I'm being kind of crass uh, there, but hopefully you can see my point. Um, so as I said, I want us to think about beyond the news, thinking about social media, fictional forms, um, whatever that takes. Um, and I want to note, I think it's important to acknowledge that we can talk about hidden agendas in terms of the media and how they report crime and things. And sometimes, you know, it gets political, but ultimately, I honestly believe you can, you can simplify it down to media companies seek profit. There's a reason why they want our eyeballs on the screen, okay? Whether that's the television screen or a computer screen or the phone or whatever it is and clicking because that draws in advertisers and that draws in profit, right? So if crime is something that draws eyeballs, it's going to get reported. So that's where murder comes into it. That's where violent crime broadly comes into it it's especially attractive to news media and there's a famous quote from Pooley way back in 1989 who said if it bleeds it leads uh, and he was writing a story about uh, a local tv news station uh, I can't remember which state of America but it was a you know a small kind of broadcaster just went to a, a local area didn't I don't even think it covered the entire state um, but just a concern he had that their news was focused on kind of the sensationalist stuff. Uh, it was focused on the violent crime um, and therefore came up with this idea or this concept that if it bleeds, it leads. Um, if there's violence, if there's gore, uh, if we've got, you know, that by play, bad offender, innocent victim, that's something that people are going to be drawn to. And often, perhaps... Next time you do happen to tune into the news, uh, again, um, I'd be curious, do, do people actually watch news still? Very rarely will I turn on TV news. Um, I don't know. No, it's, it's a curious phenomena because I think back, uh, you know, a few decades and it was really what everyone watched. Yeah, that's... I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of guffawing at Taylor's comment. I, I think it's it's true. Like it's I, I mentioned my parents. My parents are in their seventies. Uh, although my brother's he's pushing fifty, and he still very much relies on mainstream news. But yeah, it's it seems like a lot of us are on the same same sort of page. Yeah, listen to the radio. I mean, yeah, I jump on the ABC news every now and again to watch the television. But generally, yeah, it's websites, right? You just on the app and you're scrolling through and you read what you want to read and then you move on. Um, and then you go to another app for different news and another app for sport. Well, that's that's what I do. Um, so yeah, if you do happen to fall into <laughs> uh broadcast news at any point, uh, and it doesn't actually matter so much which whether you go with ABC, SBS, or one of the mainstream channels, there is a bit of a script that crime reporting follows. There will be the crime scene. Right? So you'll have your reporter standing there and in the background will be, you know, the house, a forest, whatever, right? Where the person disappeared or where something happened and you might even see the crime scene tape, right? Something like that, sirens in the back or flashing lights in the background, that kind of thing. There'll be an interview with a police officer, right? A commissioner or maybe, you know, um, first person on the scene, whatever it was. Um, there might be a witness or a bystander Case, particularly when suburban crimes, right? They'll talk to the individual and say, well, yeah, I knew them. They were pretty quiet, kept to themselves, seemed nice. Right? And you'll get that sort of thing that happens. If it progresses from there, we might then see it follow through to the court and the trial. And again, you'll get the same thing. You'll have the image of the 
you know, the person being taken from the divvy van, right, the police van into the, the holding cells or into the court and they'll have the jacket over the head, right? You, you can, hopefully you're seeing the imagery as I'm talking because we've all probably seen it without realizing and it's just what happens. So there's a script that it follows, right? Um, and that script actually then translates to fictional forms of crime shows, yeah. Um, in terms of the news though, just to stick with that for the moment, we have to say, I think, that there is a, a, a popular, popularity amongst consumers around violence in particular, around violent crime, right? We want to know what happened, uh, who was involved. Uh, probably, I think for a lot of us, it's about why it happened, right? We want to know, and this there's the fascination with serial killers, right? We want to know what leads a person to that or how a person can engage in that sort of level of heinous violence. Um, and because there is a bit more of a sort of a human interest, and I'm not suggesting we form an emotional attachment to the offender, certainly not, probably to the victim though, right? We're likely to sympathise with the victim uh, most of the time and the media often follows the script in order for us to do that. Um, yeah, and therefore more likely to follow the story. Uh, Bronwyn, big picture statement or question, why is there value in having the public feel? Well, uh, I can answer that actually, and I'll, I'll answer it more fully when we get towards the end, but the value is that fear makes people watch more, right? So I'm interested in a story, I'm curious about a story, uh, even if I'm fearful, anxious or otherwise, I will keep watching. I want to know more about what's going on. So fear, fear sort of drives or fuels further consumption. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair call, Ruth. So fear creates hypervigilance too. And that's a whole nother, there's a whole thing we could go on into with the crime industry, right? Particularly in the United States, panic rooms and weapons and all that sort of stuff, right? Doesn't translate to the cultural context that is Australia as much. Um, but certainly in terms of, um, you know, think about uh, alarm systems, CCTV, people having camera systems in their houses now, far more, right, than even five years ago. Yeah, so there is an industry, um, if you want to, yeah, you could certainly, could certainly say that fear equals engagement. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a bit of a cynical take on presenting here, right, uh, that the media basically has its own interest at heart, that is, drive viewership, drive consumption in order to drive profit. But I'm yet to come up against an argument that suggests otherwise. And that actually provides a nice segue into the next bit, which is if we think about what's, well, which cases are most likely to be reported and which ones are most likely to receive follow-up, yeah, consistent follow-up. Um, so, uh, Sajida, absolutely. If the person accused of the crime or if the crime in general, I would argue, involves a celebrity, there is going to be human interest. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. So if we have a already kind of a vested interest in the story, right, that's an easy sell for, um, for any media source. Uh, so there's the, there's the case involving Alec Baldwin right, that keeps circulating at the moment where the person was killed um, on the film set, yeah? Why are we hearing about every single detail of this? Because it involves a celebrity. So, yeah, uh, Sajida, that's a, an excellent point you make. More broadly, though, often the media is trying to draw us in, right? They're trying to create that connection between us as the consumer and them as the, you know, producer of the story. So uh, they look to focus on stories it seems anyway that are more likely for us to have that sympathy to be concerned whether that's fear or anxiety or just concern we want to see it to the end yeah and I've names I imagine that you'll recognize uh, at least some of those so um, I mean the Madeleine McCann case just keeps coming up I just had a quick uh, quick google of her name uh, yesterday in fact um, and there was something that came up with some sketch artist saying this is what she would now look like uh, as a, I think she'd be 18 or something like that now, right? So it's the sort of thing that keeps coming up. There have been 
Netflix documentaries. I remember my wife watching a Netflix documentary about her a couple of years ago. Um, it's like, I mean, it's an awful case, right? But why the fascination right, with that particular case, with that particular individual or that family? Um, the William Tyrell case is another one that recently resurfaced. So the boy who went missing um, in Victoria a few years ago, once again, four or five years ago now. Um, and then, yeah, just some of the, so as Ruth has put it, the white woman syndrome is there. So the Jill Ma case was a massive one in Victoria, in Melbourne, uh, about well, it's eight or 10 years ago now. I think it was quite some time ago, relatively speaking, um, where it was clear cut, right? The system failed to protect society because it let someone out on bail who was clearly still a threat to society. So you had your big bad offender ready made. You had your poor innocent victim in Jill Ma. Uh, you had a violent offence, right? Sold itself, yeah. Uh, Eurydice Dixon was a really interesting one. So sorry, I've got a lot of uh, Melbourne cases here, uh, being that uh, that's where I am. Uh, but the case of Eurydice Dixon, you might remember from a few years ago, she was walking home, uh, having just done a comedy gig at a pub in inner city Melbourne and was, uh, I believe, raped and killed. Um, and it was an interest. The reason I've raised that one is because it's a really interesting one where questions were not just raised about the offender and why, how could someone do this, et cetera, but why was she walking home alone at night, right? One of the most damaging, awful sentiments slash myths that exists around, um, just to go down a feminist road again, that idea that, you know, a woman needs a male protector, uh, that a woman shouldn't be out at home uh, out alone you know at night or whatever it is um so there's a few sides to this there's the there is the white woman syndrome that ruth mentioned um that likelihood that we're going to focus on a particular type of victim more than others um but there's also the way that these different victims are presented right whether we hold them at all responsible so we victim blame right or not and depends on the nature of the case uh, in the case of Jill Maher, it was sort of a clear cut, no, we can't, can't blame her. Um, in the case of Regis Dixon, it, it wasn't so clear cut. And then most recently, as I'm sure you've all been or seen, splashed on the news media, social media, et cetera, has been the, the case of Gabby Petito, um, the woman in the United States who was killed by her partner, well, allegedly, I'm not sure where that's at at the moment, but seemed to draw a lot of attention uh, globally. Um, and it's one of those things where I, I'm just sitting there scratching my head. Why are we focused on this um, in Australia, right? I can understand why in the United States maybe it gets traction, particularly in the state where it occurred or, you know, where she's from kind of thing. Uh, but there's something still like, sorry, I take back my accusation then, Bronwyn, thank you. Um, uh, there's something like still, I think about fifteen to 20,000 murders, homicides in the US every year. Right. So why is it that that one gets attention versus the other, however many thousand? Right. Um, yeah. So just some really basic questions. And some of you have already hit on these. Um, the newsworthiness of um, the victim. Right. So victims from vulnerable or minority communities tend to draw less attention. Yeah, so we talk about, you know, so family violence. Fortunately, I think it's important we acknowledge that it has hit the news and it has hit um, government more seriously over the past five or so years than it has ever before, and, and particularly since the Batty case, um, the Rosie Batty, um, or not Rosie Batty, she was the mother of the boy whose father killed him, yeah, some, some years ago, but that seemed to spark things. Um, yeah, but yeah, for whatever reason, we don't hear the same sorts of reports around, say, family violence in Indigenous communities, right? It's slightly more complicated, but not dealt with in the same way. Um, I'll come back to your question, Emily. That is a, a fair point, and I'll, yeah, I'll answer that. Um, so yeah, flowing on from that, intimate partner homicide victims. So I think still the stats suggest about one per week, one in particular, one woman per week 
in Australia will die at the hands of her intimate partner. Yeah, uh, we hear about some of those, but not all. And again, the question would be, why don't we hear about all of them? Why isn't that stat reported more widely? Um, it was a few years ago, seemed to hit the news a bit, but then it's kind of gone away again. Um, and just to flip things around, statistically, men are far more likely, not far more likely, sorry, men are more likely to be killed uh, to be victims of homicide than women are. But we tend not to hear that so much. So statistically, it's about a 60-40 roughly breakdown. Men are about 60% of all victims of homicide in Australia currently um, versus females, the rest. But it feels as though uh, we tend not to hear about that so much, or at least there's less focus. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's gender reasons for that. There's also um, the newsworthiness, right? Um, as to how the crime occurs, does it fit the script well? Uh, so just on, uh, Bronwyn, actually, did you want to, I saw you unmute. Did you want to say something or you can, or just keep going in the chat? Um, I'll just uh, refer to the chat because there are a few comments here that I've missed. So Emily, your question. Um, the reason I'm saying it was less, not so much, don't, don't hear this as me casting aspersions, please. Um, the way that it got reported, so there was a tension, rather than saying this woman was the victim of a horrible crime, there was, there was some commentary around why was this woman walking home at 3 a.m. alone? Yeah, so it was tapping into that idea that perhaps she... Yeah, uh, was at least a bit uh, or in part responsible. Um, ridiculous, yeah, and hence this idea of the, the myths around crime and particularly when you have female victims, and there's been a few of those. But, yeah, as you say, she was raped and murdered by a stranger on her way home. Um, should have been completely cast as, you know, the innocent victim. But the offender, even in that, from memory, uh, had oh, some... There was a mental health issue. There might have been something else going on. Um, but, yeah, for whatever reason, it wasn't cast in the same way as the Juma murder, right? It wasn't as clear-cut the way that it got reported. Um, some of the other comments. Sorry, I'm just wary of time. We've only got about 10 more minutes. Uh, yeah, so Kirsty, thanks. So recent studies suggesting people experience greater empathy when people look like them too. So that might have part to do with it. Yeah, we are a Western society, so we want to see people who resemble a Western person, perhaps. Um, yeah, I th oh, there's a whole lot. I think that's a fair point around um, Indigenous issues. Um, they are often thrown in the too hard basket, not just by media, but by politicians. Yeah, fair call. Um, there's a fair bit to unpack there, which I'll have to handle <laughs> to another day. Um, or if you study our course, we have a whole unit on Indigenous peoples and justice and obviously touch on it in a number of areas because it's just so, so significant. Um, yeah, and yeah, Ebony, it's an interesting one you raise around uh, Indigenous versus non-Indigenous views of crime. There is some of that. Um, but when there's clear cut, we can run a comparison around sort of clear cut um, cases. So when I say clear cut, like where there's, it's homicide, right? So say in a family violence case, a male has murdered a female. Again, doesn't get, doesn't get reported the same way. Um, yeah. And there is, yeah, uh, Bronwyn, I think that's important acknowledgement. Depends on what else is going on. Yeah. Elections, COVID. Yeah major sporting events unfortunately uh well as a sports fan yeah good but as a person sports not important compared to you know all this other stuff so i think that's that maybe just speaks to my earlier argument that it's about attracting eyeballs right so what are people going to be most interested in and in, on cup day in probably the country to be honest not just in melbourne because we just get a stupid public holiday for it but uh, you know, people are going to want to see the race again for whatever reason. Um, we want to hear the result of the whatever code match was on. Yeah, we want to know what's happening in the test match, all that sort of stuff. So 
yeah, uh, on the one hand, the media tells us to be really scared about crime. And at the same time, sometimes it gets pushed back because people kick the ball. Um, all right, broadly speaking, and to cut back to content here. So I think if we flip it a little bit, and it's not just about the news media, but it's about all forms of media and the way that uh, crime features, there is a proliferation, a massive proliferation of true crime content. Yeah, um, I think it was you, Bronwyn, who mentioned podcasts. I mean, there have been books and documentaries and movies and TV series and now podcasts and everything else you can think of, right, about violent crime, about specific cases, about crime in general, uh, all sorts of things. Um, it reinforces the level of interest uh, that people have in, the, in crime, in criminal justice, et cetera. Part of the problem, though, is that it helps with the proliferation of misunderstandings about crime. Um, and this is problematic, right, for reasons that I'll get into. Now, I'm just going to breeze through. So feel free to keep the comments coming in the chat, but I am going to, because technically I'm meant to be done at eight. Um, so I will just breeze through some things. Um, there are quite inaccurate societal perceptions of crime that exist. I already mentioned one myth around, you know, people assume that, uh, those who are abused become abusers. That is not, not true. Um, the reality bears that out now. Yeah, we, we have a clear understanding that's not the case. Um, often, as well, just the way that criminal, uh, crime rather is reported feels as though criminal behaviour is seen, or it's a rare thing, it doesn't happen much. In fact, crime happens all the time. Yeah. Um, if you consider that crime is everything from jaywalking so-called jaywalking, through to traffic offences, through to drug use, through to fraud, through to property offences, through to then violent offences, there are a number of ways that we can break the law and more often than not, there's someone doing it, right? Um, what the news presents though, and certainly, and I think this is true of uh, all media, media tends to focus on the particularly bad, gory, and also abnormal behaviours. Right. So there's a preoccupation, for example, with serial killers. Why? Because they're rare. Um, they're completely abnormal, right? If we're just using that word really broadly uh, compared to other crime, compared to what we consider to be everyday people. Um, and what that can lead to is that the prevalence and nature of certain offences becomes exaggerated. So we feel as though uh, there is more murder than there actually is right so um here's a question for you uh, estimate how many homicides so that is all murders and manslaughter cases there are in australia in any given year can you put a number on it um if you had to guess uh and ebony yeah bang on it's that it is that drawer of the taboo yeah it's those weird and wacky cases and particularly the ultra violent cases that seem to draw our attention uh, and i will provide you with an answer to how many homicides on average we tend to have so um if you do have an answer. Uh, thanks, Miles, for kicking that off and way over. Uh, Ruth, thanks as well, way over. You are, uh, Miles has had a double dip, yeah, he's hit it. So it is around about 250, right, in any given year. Yeah, that's, that's a good range, Bronwyn, yeah, one to 300. So um, we're at about 250, 260 at the moment, annually across the entire country. Right, all murders and all uh, manslaughter cases. So that's all homicide cases. So it's pretty respectable, okay, um, compared to, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, yeah, compared to most Western jurisdictions, we're, we're sitting pretty healthy. Um, and certainly across the world, we're sitting pretty healthy. But, you know, people watching the news every night might have a very different perception of that because it gets reported, yeah. Um, and yeah, murder and criminal behaviour broadly, but especially violent crime tends to be mythologised. So there is that idea of it's almost evil, right? Someone needs to be evil in order to commit certain crimes. Objectively, evil is, it's good. I like horror movies, you know, having evil in horror movies is great, but uh, it doesn't help us understand anything. Right? It doesn't help us understand motivations of an individual. It doesn't help us to understand how they got to a point where they are committing whatever act. Yeah. Um, 
And there also tends to be an othering or a stigmatizing of offenders too, right? We push uh, uh, offenders out, right? They're um, marginalized because they're the other, they're the bad people, we're the good people. But technically, I'm not suggesting we're all capable of murder, but I dare say most of us have probably committed at least one criminal act. And again, consider that we're ranging from jaywalking and uh, traffic offences and minor drug use through to more serious things, right? We've probably all done something against the law at some point. So it is, again, problematic to simplify it down to bad, good and bad, certainly good and evil is not a helpful um, conception of things. Um, so, yeah, there is the sensationalism aspect. There are, you know, um, and we don't have time for this, but, um, you know, we need to consider just how many causes of crime there are and there are multiple and they often coincide there. There's never just probably one thing. There's maybe individual psychological factors combined with social factors, maybe combined with structural stuff, right? The place that people are in society, right? Or the place that society has put them in because of, you know, gender or ethnicity slash race or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, and all of that conspires to why maybe certain people are more likely to commit crime than others, yeah? But that, again, is a perception of things. So, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, but someone mentioned um, white-collar crime early on. White-collar crime doesn't get much attention because it's more complicated. You don't have the crime scene tape, right? You don't have the blood stains on the road. Um, there's, you know, arguably some... Some researchers argue there is just as much white collar crime or, you know, uh, crime being committed by corporations as there is crime committed by everyday people like us, right? And arguably probably more than uh, certainly violent crime going on. But yeah, indeed, can't be sensationalised, Miles. Uh, it's a fair point. Um, you still can get your bad offender who you want to throw eggs at, but we're not as maybe repulsed we're not as disgusted, there's maybe less of a fear factor when it comes to a white collar offender, yeah, compared to, say, one of the pictures you've got there. Um, yeah. Um, oh yeah. There's, so there's a whole bunch of different crime myths, and sorry, I don't have time. We've touched on some of these. Um, so there are the, the issues around um, offenders and how they are constructed as well as victims and the way they're constructed. So our conversation around why, you know, sort of white women syndrome, uh, as we talked about, feeds into, um, if you're interested, Niels Christie wrote a paper called The Ideal Victim going back a good 20 or 30 years, but it still resonates, right? The, the way that certain victims are glamorized versus others being um, stigmatized yeah, and, and held responsible, if not fully, at least partly for being a victim of all things, yeah? And we know, so particularly around, say, um, sexual acts, sexual crimes, particularly, so men against women, um, against women, you know, the woman being blamed for what she was wearing, for flirting, for ridiculous stuff, yeah? But these are part of the mythology of crime um, that unfortunately have impacted at the, the real level, yeah, in the criminal justice system. Um, and this is all through to the, the effectiveness of the criminal justice system. So the role that police play, their ability, um, whether sentencing works or not. So someone mentioned earlier about, you know, deterrence, people um, watching the news and being fearful and being deterred doesn't work that way. Sentencing doesn't, you know, prison doesn't deter people as such. Um, if you're going to commit a violent crime, you have the propensity to commit a violent crime. Deterrence isn't going to do it. Most of us are just deterred because, you know, it's... It's not the right thing to do. Uh, it's our social influences, our, our upbringing, our position in society, all that. There's, there's so many different factors to it. Um, yeah, I won't get into the mythic profilers aspect, but if you've ever watched a profiling, a criminal profile, criminal minds, those sorts of, so much BS in those. All right. Um, just on the, the fictional side of media, uh, in the run home, um, Sorry, yes, CJS is criminal justice system. Apologies, Ruth. Uh, and I have seen those other comments. So I'll come back to those. Um, a really interesting phenomenon we've seen over the last couple of, or last decade or so, but it does extend pre that. Um, Mostyn and Coventry talk about the CSI effect. And this is literally from the program CSI, uh, which has been going for a long time and has multiple franchises now. 
but follows the script, right? Crime scene um, doesn't have the law and order the duh, part, which I think is a failing, but they, they all start the same way, right? Crime scene, investigators arrive on scene, do all the things that they do. These programs though, and people watch them and even though we might know they're fictional, it still frames people's view of crime and society and all of these sorts of things, yeah. Um, and again, we see violent crime overrepresented, right? They're not sending the CSI team to dust the photocopy of fingerprints because it was used in a, a white collar offense, right? In some sort of scam or, or fraud. Um, yeah, uh, and that's, it's not just sort of the CSI franchise itself, it's, it's probably most fictional programs. Um, and note, it's not just American media. We tend, our minds tend to go to American media. UK, uh, English programs are probably worse um, with all of the various Agatha Christie's and Miss Marple's and all these sorts of ones that they have. Um, yeah, nuts, nuts. The amount of, um, yeah, <laughs> you've got all the Scandinavian stuff now. That's true, Kirsty, uh, that's coming through. Um, yeah, well, I'd maybe watch it an episode or two Bronwyn but no I don't think it would um you get the gender thing that's done the criminal justice process tends to get simplified a whole lot too right very rarely in any television program is the offender not caught is justice not done right and that actually provides people with a um an assumption that that is reality um there was a study done way back in the 1990s in the US on the show Cops uh, which was kind of the first reality TV program, um, reality TV, right, manufactured, but where you had the camera crew following around police yeah, on the streets of LA or whatever. And that led to people thinking that offenders were far more likely to be Hispanic or African-American. Um, and in fact, there was, the, the study found that even when shown or where race wasn't mentioned, people were more likely to have just have remembered seeing a Hispanic or an African-American offender, right? So even though this is TV, uh, these representations do actually impact, right? People's actual um, thoughts, beliefs, uh, attitudes around crime and about criminal justice. Um, yeah, that's a, an interesting one. Uh, yeah, both Ebony and Emily, your comments there. So yeah, again, the, the, the time it takes Right. I mean, you think about even in Australia, what it's it's three months to six months just to get to the magistrate's court, let alone get to the county court for a, a serious offence, right? for a murder trial, etc. It's not a, yeah, uh, we found you yesterday and you're in jail tomorrow kind of thing. Um, and yeah, Emily, there's been a, a massive um, leap in people's assumptions around forensic evidence uh, and thinking that, you know, fingerprints, the DNA, that these are infallible. Uh, that they will prove to 100% accuracy that those things work. And yet, and yet, no. Uh, I mean, fingerprinting has um, been proven not to be as accurate as we think it is um, and far more difficult to actually acquire fingerprints. Yet, you know, it's if you watch enough TV, you think, oh, let's get the fingerprints, right? I've had a break and enter at my house. Coppers come around and take the fingerprints. <laughs> it's worked that way. Yeah. Uh, yes. Wine glasses, coffee cups, all sorts of things, right? Um, yeah, so the problem is uh, that it does lead to misunderstandings of crime <clears throat> and it does actually result in ineffective policy responses. So the fictional world and the way that news media works actually has real world implications. The media sensationalism that we talked about leads to fear of crime, as you guys acknowledged and, and recognised. And it leads to what we call law and order politics, populist punitive policies. That is, we're going to hire, so as Dan Andrews in Victoria announced about a, oh, a couple of weeks ago, a few months ago, oh, a month ago, we're going to have X amount more police officers in Victoria. So Victorians feel safe, right? Depending on who you are, you might not actually feel safe that there are more police around, okay? And the other thing that people don't recognise is, in fact, the more police you have, you get more crime because you have more police to report crime to and who are going to detect crime. So a more efficient criminal justice system actually leads to more crime, which can lead to more fear and around and around you go. Yeah. So there's fun. Um, and yeah, sorry, folks, I know I'm over time. So if you do need to run, do. Uh, apologies. 
Um, yeah, and obviously it becomes more costly as well. It's taxpayer money that pays for this stuff when it doesn't actually help, right? Building another prison might make us feel safer somehow, but it doesn't actually reduce crime. It just leads to more people being locked up and more people therefore likely to reoffend because prisons often don't rehabilitate people as well as they should or could. Um, and yeah, the other thing just to raise is um, whether our focus on violent crime actually glamorizes or normalizes violence. Um, do we become a little bit just sort of desensitized to it? Um, you know, this is the glamorization of serial killers. Uh, we can probably all name a number of serial killers, but I doubt we could name the whole or an equal number of victims. Yeah. So there's all of that stuff as well, just as a broader thought. All right. So, yeah, there's no getting away from this. This is something that's going to be going on for probably forever. Um, there'll always be interest in crime. The media will therefore follow it uh, because it sells. Um, but what's really important is, uh, is just being sort of critical, right? Thinking about sources of information, um, whether it's a person talking at you through a, through a camera, whether it's something we see on TV or, or read on a social media site, right? We need to be critical. We need to think about it. Um, Etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Sorry. Throw your questions through. There's a few that I'll just roll back to, uh, but there's contact details. So, David, Miles, uh, Alex, uh, I think there are a few others in the background there who are ready to answer questions about the courses. You can email me if you'd like um, to ask me anything. Um, and yeah, I'll just, if people are happy to hang around for a bit, I will go back and, uh, and Amelia's thrown in her email there as well so thanks for that Amelia um just scrolling so there was a question uh, uh Sajida I think um people might have answered it for you uh so yes around that um I mean I'm, I'm presenting it and maybe it's just the language I use, but there is yeah, research to support a lot of the things that I've been talking about, the relationship between crime and the media, um, the impacts of that, et cetera. At the same time, criminology is a social science. And that means sometimes there are not clear cut answers, right? There is no X, it has to be X, Y, and Z. So like I said, you know, can we easily answer why people commit crime? Hell no. Um, if you give me a specific case, you know, potentially, uh, you know, we can point out a collection of things or, or sort of nut it down to a few things. But um, yeah, it, as, it's, as you say, as long as you can substantiate your points of view, right? Is there research to support it? Is there a valid argument to support it? Then, you know, we can accept it. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's criminology, that's social science um, kind of broadly. Um, all right. Uh, I think that was the only one I left behind. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that colouring book. I saw those somewhere, Bronwyn, and I was I don't think that's in good taste at all. Uh, just that those would be produced, let alone anything else. Um, okay, it looks like it's pretty quiet on the chat. Uh, so we can leave it there thank you every, thank you everyone for coming along uh thanks for your participation your contribution i had fun uh, and i hope you did too uh and yeah as david said earlier there there are sessions for uh counseling and also psychology tomorrow night so if you'd like to hear from some of my colleagues at, at acap in the other disciplines and hearing about the sorts of things they talk about in their courses um yeah do do jump on those. So yeah, I'll uh, leave you to it. Thanks again for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday nights. Cheers. <laughs>